Hello and welcome back to the ECG course. This is chapter 15. In this chapter, I'm just going to cover some things that I haven't talked about. Uh, some people might consider them uh, advanced EKG interpretation concepts. A lot of uh, instructors don't actually teach this in the basic course. Um, but I'm going to include some of this because if you go on and you, you read some arrhythmia textbooks out there, you're going to see some of this terminology. And uh, it's good to just kind of have a foundation, uh, you know, a simple understanding to sort of be able to uh, interpret EKGs a little bit better. So the first thing we'll talk about is the intrinsicoid deflection. Don't let the uh, term intrinsicoid confuse you. It's really not that uh, difficult of a, of a finding to look for or uh, an aspect of the EKG to look for, whatever you like to call it. Uh, Brugada sign, Josephson sign, fusion beats, and capture beats, all of these things will help you to identify ventricular arrhythmias. And why is that important? Well, if you've learned about aberrancy, you know, my previous lecture, you've learned that it may be difficult to differentiate wide complex tachycardias. For instance, is it a supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy, or is it a ventricular tachycardia? And a good rule of thumb to sort of live by is that if you see a wide complex tachycardia and you're not sure what it is, you should assume that it's ventricular until proven otherwise. Uh, Pre-excitation. So you may have heard of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. I'm going to talk a little bit about that and explain exactly what it is. And then re-entry. I've talked about re-entry uh, previously with the SVT discussion. So I'm going to explain AV nodal re-entries, and I'm going to explain ventricular re-entries. Just sort of some brief discussion, give you a little bit more intuition behind those things. So the intrinsic coid deflection, what is that? Well, the intrinsic coid deflection is everything, it's the measurement that begins at the beginning of the QRS complex and ends at the peak of the R wave. Okay, it's that very first deflection. All right, the very first deflection is the intrinsic coid deflection. And it should be no longer than 0.10 seconds or 100 milliseconds. 0.10 seconds, which is roughly equal to two and a half small boxes. Okay, if it's longer than that, it's an indication of a ventricular arrhythmia. So the intrinsic coid deflection is actually just that component of the EKG that starts at the beginning of the QRS complex and goes till the peak of the R wave. And if it's longer than that, it's called Brugada sign. If it's longer than that 0.10 seconds, you call it Brugada sign. Uh, the Brugada brothers are a couple of uh, EKG gods, so to speak. They've really come, come out with a lot of research on different things. You may have heard of Brugada syndrome. Uh, we'll talk about that with 12 leads. Um, and there's a lot of different things that they have the Brugada criteria and the Brugada sign and, and, and different things that they've come out with. And Brugada sign just happens to be one of those things that helps you to differentiate uh, a supraventricular rhythm with aberrancy from a ventricular rhythm. You also have Josephson sign. And Josephson sign, unlike Brugada sign, is going to be an actual physical finding that you see on there, that little aspect right there, that little notch within the downslope of this QS complex. So you see that this wave here is a QS wave because it has no positive deflection, so it's a QS, that's what they call it. And you'll see on the very first line of the intrinsic coid deflection, you have that little bit of a notch. And that just makes it highly in, in, uh, suggestive of a ventricular origin. Uh, so if, again, if you're thinking maybe this is a ventricular arrhythmia, that's a good indication. So, so far we talked about the intrinsic coid deflection, uh, Brugada sign, Josephson sign. Now let's talk about fusion and capture beats. So this rhythm here, let's say we have a uh, idioventricular or an accelerated ventricular arrhythmia here. So these Vs over on this side stand for ventricular. So those are your ventricular, this is your underlying rhythm right here. So this underlying rhythm is continuing and then all of a sudden you have something like this right here. That is a capture beat. And the reason you get a capture beat is this. Just because you have a ventricular arrhythmia, it doesn't mean that your atria are not depolarizing. So the atria are still depolarizing. You just may have 
AV nodal disassociation, much like you do with a complete heart block or a third degree heart block. Now this P wave that continues throughout, you can't see it too well for the most part, just happened to fire right there after the refractory period, which was a good time for a new complex to occur. So that atrial depolarization occurred, and then you got ventricular depolarization as a result. So you had a full capture beat from a different pacemaker right here. All right? But that ventricular, that underlying ventricular rhythm is still going to continue throughout. Okay? And in fact, it did happen again right here. This is where that underlying ventricular rhythm would have occurred. But this one just so happened to have occurred when one of these capture beats was also going to occur. So that atrial rate happened to be perfect enough to where the ventricular rate matched up with it right here, causing what they call a fusion beat. A fusion beat is literally the fusion of two different pathways conducting at the same time and sort of meeting up in the middle. So the ventricular origin depolarized, that atrial origin depolarized, and they both met up, and this is what they made. So this fusion beat here is a combination of the capture beat and the ventricular beat. And the presence of these help you to identify a ventricular arrhythmia. If you see those, that's a good indication of a ventricular arrhythmia. In fact, if you see AV nodal disassociation at all, if you just see P waves marching throughout, but there's no association with the QRS complex, that's another good indication that you're dealing with a ventricular arrhythmia. All right, let's change gears a little bit and let's talk about Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. What the heck is Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome? Well, I'll tell you what it is. Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is when somebody has a bypass tract in their heart connecting the atria and the ventricles. So usually no depolarization takes place all right, through the atria and ventricles outside of, of course, your normal pathway. But some people have this little bypass tract between the atria and ventricles, and it can be in the left, on the left side or on the right side. And a lot of times it's called the Kent bundle or the bundle of Kent. So that's what I'll refer to it as. So you got the Kent bundle there. And what do we know happens with normal depolarization? With normal depolarization, you get a P wave from your atrial depolarization. You get a little PR segment from the AV nodal pause. And then you get a QRS complex and then a T wave. Right? So that's what happens with normal depolarization down the normal pathway. But think about having this accessory pathway right here. You have this accessory pathway where the polarization can go directly from the atria into the ventricles. There's no pause at the AV node with this bypass tract, right? So you get pre-excitation. And your P wave and your QRS complex may be right next to each other because of it. Because you'll go directly from depolarizing the atria to depolarizing the ventricle without an AV nodal pause. Now, once it makes it to the ventricles, that depolarization is going to be a little bit slower, right? Because we know if you're outside of this highway over here, you're going to be taking the back roads, going from cell to cell to cell. So that's what happens. Once it makes it, it gets to the ventricles quicker, but once it makes it here, it's going to go from cell to cell to cell to cell, and it's going to take a little bit longer, which would give you a widened QRS complex. Now, typically what happens is you'll get the polarization down your normal pathway, your physiologic pathway, and the polarization down the bypass tract. So if you just took your normal depolarization with your PR segment there, and you just kind of continued that up, you create what's called a delta wave, and it ends up looking something like that. And it's literally a fusion beat of this normal physiologic conduction and this antidromic conduction as they fuse together. Because once you get to the ventricles on this side, or the bundle of Kent side, you're going to go slower. So this physiologic conduction, once it makes it past the AV node, it's going to be quick, and they're going to meet up somewhere in the middle, right? So that's what you get. Now you can also have different kinds of conduction, such as 
Uh, if for some reason we gave this patient an AV nodal blocking agent like Cardizem, which wouldn't be good, you would block this physiological conduction and you would end up with this retrograde or antidromic conduction and you can actually create a reentry phenomenon that'll end up being a lot like ventricular tachycardic, ventricular tachycardia. So it's not really a good idea to give any AV nodal uh, blocking agents to somebody with uh, WPW because it'll end up taking the path of least resistance. You also can have just normal orthodromic conduction that returns back up the bypass tract, okay? And that can also create a different kind of reentry. A lot of times these patients will go into supraventricular tachycardias, all right? But it's important to identify the WPW if possible or ask them about it and try to avoid AV nodal slowing agents. So here again are your classic findings when you have WPW. You have a shortened PR interval, a widened QRS complex, and a delta wave. That would be your classic findings. You don't always see it because they have different types of conduction. All right. So this image on the right here, this WPW image, is literally if you just took the normal conduction and just added a delta wave. All right. And then got rid of all of this. That would be, give you what's over here on the right. So it's a fusion beat of the normal conduction and the uh, antegrade conduction as well. So that's important to, re important to remember as you go on, uh, you sort of look for those findings. Now let's talk about reentry. First we'll talk about AV nodal reentry. And I've told you before, AV nodal reentry sort of occurs right in this area, and you'll just constantly be depolarizing the ventricles and coming back up, depolarizing the ventricles and coming back up. All right, and here's sort of what happens if we create a, a quick little picture of the AV node. With AV reentry, you have a slow pathway and a fast pathway, okay? And normally that doesn't create a problem. You know, you just depolarize down, you'll depolarize down the slow pathway, depolarize down the fast pathway a little bit quicker, those two will meet up, it'll go down into the His bundle and then depolarize your ventricles. But if you get a premature atrial contraction or atrial premature depolarization, that can create a problem where you depolarize down the AV node It'll want to go down the fast pathway, but won't be able to because of the refractory period. It'll slowly depolarize down the AV node and then the ventricles. Well, by the time it makes it over here to where the fast pathway is, well, now that refractory period is over with, and it will continue to depolarize that. And as that depolarization wave makes it around, I'm now moving over to image C here, now the slow pathway has repolarized, and you can end up in what you see here in the image D, a reentry where it constantly goes around and around and around. And that'll give you something like this on the bottom here, an SVT. Uh, to be more specific, it's called AV nodal reentry tachycardia. That is the actual arrhythmia. Okay, so that is sort of physiologically what's happening. You have normal depolarization, and then all of a sudden you'll get a premature atrial contraction. And that will cause no depolarization of the fast pathway until this depolarization makes it down to the end of the slow pathway and this fast pathway has been repo repolarized. Now it can just be depolarized again and then you end up with that reentry circuit. So you need to use an AV nodal agent like adenosine to kind of break that reentry. With ventricular reentry, it's very similar, okay? You don't have a slow pathway or a fast pathway. But these Purkinje fibers in the ventricles, um, they could be damaged. So let's say one of them's damaged. And, or you could have a PVC. And this is, a, in fact, how PVCs often occur because of a damaged Purkinje fiber. You know, you'll have depolarization down both. This is normal, right? And then it'll depolarize the rest of the, the fibers in the myocardium. All right? Now you could also have depolarization come down, and it can get blocked. Let's say it gets blocked in this damaged area. Or let's say that area is in a refractory mode because of a PVC. Well, it'll come down, come around, and by the time that depolarization wave comes around, you could end up with this area now repolarized, and you'll create a reentry circuit. Okay? As that comes around, because by the time it makes it around, this is repolarized over here, this is repolarized, and then it continues, and it comes around here, 
Now this is repolarized and you've created a reentry circuit within the ventricles and that's how you end up with something like ventricular tachycardia. That's why they call this stuff advanced because it's a little bit more of an advanced understanding of, of your cardiac physiology. I don't think it's that difficult. Um, the first time you watch this video, you might not completely understand it. Watch it a couple more times. Read up on it a little bit. It's not that difficult to understand. And once you do, it really does give you some great intuition uh, as far as interpreting EKGs and as far as understanding what treatment will be the best treatment for the patient. That's what's really the most important thing here. So that's all I have for you. I gave you a couple more uh, key tricks to uh, identify ventricular origins. I told you a little bit about WPW. Now, that's not the only type of accessory pathway. You also have other ones like Laung-Ganong-Levine syndrome, which I'll discuss more in the uh, up-and-coming 12-lead lectures. And I talked so somewhat about reentry, AV nodal reentry and ventricular reentry. And I hope you got something out of it. And uh, if you're ready, if you want to, go on and, and click on this right image here and head over to the Rhythm Challenge. All it is is just a bunch of different EKG rhythms, and I'm quickly going to go through them, and uh, hopefully you can identify them. If not, if you want to go back to the previous chapter, chapter 14, click on that left image. It'll take you to the asystole and artifact chapter. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because there are going to be a whole lot of videos coming up and great lessons. All right, until next time, I'll see you later.